Have you ever started playing a game and struggled to stop? Daddy, I'm late for school. Yeah, one minute, one minute. Have you come off that game, maybe to eat or go to school or work, but found that your thoughts and concentration are still locked deep within that game's universe? I'm Karth, one of the Republic soldiers from the Endar Spire. I was with you in the escape pod, do you remember? Have you ever finished a game and felt a wave of satisfaction and gone straight into your web browser to search for any sequels? Hello everyone, my name is Retro Reclaimer, a video game enthusiast, and in this video I'm going to highlight and identify the factors that make a video game good, as well as what I consider to be the overall key ingredient to making a video game amazing. Video games have been at the forefront of the entertainment industry for many years, certainly before the time I was born. The arcade scene was highly prevalent in the 80s and the transition from the arcades to the home console made playing video games much more accessible. Uh, and probably less expensive. It was a way of experiencing a story and having fun, and socialising through multiplayer games with your friends. I'm not going to pretend that I know what the 70s meant for video games, as I quite frankly haven't got a clue, but by the time the 90s came about, which is the decade I was born, arcades were much less of a popular place and home consoles were in most households. The earliest memory I have of a home console was a Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES, or NES, depending on your geographical location. Skip forward to 2021 and video gaming is dominant in the entertainment industry, with A-list games such as Call of Duty, FIFA Football and Fortnite profiting way more than even some of the highest grossing films such as Avatar, Fast and Furious and even the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Whatever decade you played games in, there have been some incredible experiences, along with incredible disappointments. But games like Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Mega Drive, Super Mario World on the SNES, and Final Fantasy VII on the PS1 will forever be remembered as great retro games. Until, of course, the retro as we know today becomes vintage and then historic and, and then maybe even forgotten about completely. But the memories of those games that we loved will stay with us forever, providing that our souls and memories live on when our bodies return to the Earth, of course. Now, before we start arguing about what is retro and what isn't, or whether the afterlife exists or it doesn't, let's move on to the factors that make a video game a good video game. Okay, so there are many different factors that you can look at when evaluating a game, and I have always watched and read reviews and thought that, you know, that's not important, who cares about that, you forgot about this, etc. So bear in mind, you may feel this way about the factors that I talk about, and that is totally fine. In fact, I respect and highly appreciate the input of others, and the comment section below provides a great way for you to speak your mind and respond to this as you see fit. I will respond to every comment I get, but please keep the trolling and negativity at bay, if you can. Okay, so the first factor that makes a good game is joy. Joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness, and if we experience this whilst playing a game, we are certainly going to consider it a good game. Unless, of course, joy is not something that you're searching for. These aren't the droids you're looking for. This factor is interesting as individuals gain joy from a wide range of different things, and if we're experiencing joy, we're generally having fun. Stepping out of an elevator into a room containing eggs, a swimming pool, and fruit bearing trees immediately fills me with joy. Hatching the eggs and seeing a cute little baby chow asking to be picked up screams joy. Until, of course, I attempt to pick the baby up, end up doing a sonic spin dash and flinging the baby across the room, leaving it drowning in the pool and crying its little eyes out. I'm such a terrible parent! However, the same feeling of joy I receive from this, other individuals may not do so. Three egg yolks, separated from the white. Some individuals will find joy from driving really fast and hitting that NOS button to go even faster, whilst others would rather take their time and stop at every traffic light they come across, on their way to see Lester about robbing a bank. The retro gaming community can enjoy playing old games on old consoles using TVs with big boxes on the back of them, whereas others consider them to be no fun at all. Daddy, I'm bored of playing all your rubbish games. I want to play some Fortnite, I want to play different games. Anyway, I think you get the picture. Joy is an experience that we all get for different reasons. Whilst developers can create their games to suit a particular type of person or age group, they can't be assured that every individual will find joy in their game, which I'm sure they are well aware of. So my first factor that makes a good game is joy. If you experience joy whilst playing a game, you are most probably going to come back to it. If you don't, you'll probably look for something else. Factor number two. 
Okay, so the second factor that makes a good game is graphics. Now I'm not listing these factors in order of importance or anything like that. In fact, I have listed graphics second simply because I want to have my say on it and move on. Graphics is all about the audio and how good the game sounds. Hey, hello, just checking that you're still listening. Yes, it has totally got nothing to do with the audio. When we talk about graphics, we are looking at the visuals of the game. Now, our expectations of the graphics in a game will differ immensely, depending on the age of the game, the setting or environment of the game, and a range of other reasons. Bosnall's head's not that big. What is this? Of course, the further we go back in history, the less our expectations will be with regards to the graphics. I know my son, Oscar, is reluctant to play any games on the Sega Mega Drive. But Daddy, it's rubbish. What do you mean it looks rubbish? I just froze that guy solid and it looks ping. Ping is the word that is in at the moment with the youth of the UK. It means nice or good. Okay, I'm sure that when Mortal Kombat was first released, everyone was blown away by the graphics of the digitised sprites of the characters, but compare that to the graphics that are delivered today with the use of motion capture and much higher advancements in technology, it's kind of hard to go back and play these retro games without the nostalgia that we all have for them. To make graphics a fair factor to be judged by, I guess you have to be flexible. What is the theme of the game? Some games are developed purposely to have a retro look to them, and others choose a more cartoony look, so it wouldn't be fair to judge them against the likes of Red Dead Redemption 2 for example. So with regard to the graphics making a game good, it all depends on what you expect from the game itself. If your game consists of a lot of time riding horses in a real world environment, then those horses better have flexing muscles, dripping with sweat, and if the horseshoe impressions aren't left in the dirt behind you, then it would be fair to say that the graphics aren't leaving a good impression at all. Likewise, if your game is built for virtual reality, then the mechanics and immersion are much more important than the graphical fidelity. So in this instance, men made out of a fragile red crystal substance are highly acceptable, and the game can still have a high graphics score. Bringing this factor into applause then, I think it is fair to say that the graphics of a game should be relevant to that of the setting and type of game you are playing. We want an open world game that is based on a real world location to look as real as possible, whereas open world games that are intended for younger persons or fantasy worlds that involve mythical creatures and ridiculously oversized weapons can get away with creating less real world like and stick to a more cartoony environment. Graphically, they might not be able to compete with their counterparts but this was never really the aim. The same goes for racing games and racing simulator games. If I am playing Forza Motorsports or Gran Turismo, I want my cars to look like they do in the real world. But if I'm playing Star Wars Super Bombad Racing, I want everything to look goofy and fun. Overall, I don't think that the graphics of a particular game leaves a huge impression to most gamers, and you simply cannot argue with the graphical capabilities of the consoles that most people have in this day and age. I believe that the graphical standard we set ourselves are usually met and exceeded with the games that we play today. The technology is just too good. Although I'm sure there are many that can argue this and list a plethora of games, I invite you to do so below in the comments. Factor number three. Let's choose in-game mechanics and controls. Yes, these two can be looked at separately, but this is my video and I have the power. Again, continuing the running theme here of expectations for particular games, the same can be said for this aspect. I want realistic tennis games like Top Spin to feel real and have realistic mechanics, but if I am playing Mario Tennis Open, I want slow motion action shots of Mario floating in the air and hitting the tennis ball with such force that it leaves a trail of light behind it and is unstoppable by my opponents on the other side of the court. I'm a big fan of the Tom Clancy games, and alright, who isn't? When Ghost Recon Wildlands came out, I was super excited. Created my character, made him look as British as I could, 
Uh, but when I got in the helo with my two pals and we came crashing down to the ground, I was shocked that I was able to survive the impact and simply climb out and continue to run up the hill. I thought at first that this was my real life army training kicking in and I had just activated beast mode. But then I could see that this was true. The mechanics of the game were just very, very poor. When looking at other games that were released even prior to this, such as GTA 5, and you compare the mechanics of sprinting down a street, hitting that right trigger on your gamepad and watching your character punch a random civilian who falls to the ground and drops his coffee all over the pavement, or a sidewalk for my American friends, America! Ellen! you almost feel guilty for doing so, because of how real it felt. The mechanics of a game go hand in hand with the controls, because well, I don't know why, just because they do. No, it's about how the game feels, your connection with the character or the vehicle that you're controlling. The controls and the on-screen actions need to match. There is a reason why the trigger on your controller is a trigger. How many times do you press the A button to shoot? Okay, maybe once or twice, but more often than not, when you hear Tango down after filling your enemy full of lead, you've just squeezed a trigger, like you would the trigger of a gun. This adds to the authenticity and immersion. That's terrible! Why would you say that? Controllers are evolving as fast as a Metapod at the moment, and the PS5 controllers now have a haptic feedback feature, which pushes the immersion boundaries even further closer to reality. But seriously, have you seen how fast Metapod evolves? I mean, Caterpie evolved at level 7, and that was fast, but Metapod evolved after only 3 more levels, no messing about. Okay, coming to the end of this factor. The fact that the controls and mechanics of a game can add to the immersion, reality, realism, and well, control of the overall experience leaves either a positive or a negative affinity to the player, and therefore it is an important factor that makes a game a good game. Factor number four, immersion and customization. Something I have already talked about briefly in some of the aforementioned factors. Immersion is the deep mental involvement in something. No, no. Not submersion, that is the act of something being submerged into a body of water, like when Ragnar Lothbrok was baptised by the French so that he could see his friend Athelstan again when he dies. When we play a video game, a lot of the time we play it in a first person perspective. Examples of this are the Call of Duty series, the Forza Motorsport series, Halo, Star Wars Battlefront, well, not if you're a hero like Luke Skywalker, <laughs> that would be crazy, you can't be Luke Skywalker. Uh, but even GTA 5 introduced an update that allowed for a first person perspective, which was later used in the release of Red Dead Redemption 2. I mean, how else could you make going to the strip club more enjoyable? Eh? Yeah? Am I right? Uh, uh, just me then. The reason for developers to use this perspective is because they want the player, that is you, to become immersed in the game and feel like it is yourself holding that rifle or looking through the windscreen with the steering wheel in one hand and the gear stick in the other. That is the shifter for my friends in America. America! Ellen! Some developers even go further than just a perspective of a game. Ever wondered why the Master Chief doesn't take off his helmet? Or why he rarely spoke unless he was saying To give the Covenant back their bomb. Or when he's about to leap into open space with a nuclear bomb during a galactic dogfight with no real way of controlling himself and his trajectory with an aim to enter, land into the centre of an enemy ship and rearm the bomb before evading the blast zone and returning safely to his own ship so much room for things to go wrong I'm sat there with my controller in my hand thinking OH MY GOD Even Cortana questions it Just one question What if you miss? And how does the chief respond to this? I won't. That very short answer and the lack of dialogue was intended by the developers as they wanted the player to feel like the Master Chief rather than the Master Chief had him having his own personality. This effect adds to the immersion. Other games had you making key decisions such as Mass Effect without spoiling the game for anyone who hasn't played it and if you haven't played it then you really really need to because it is amazing but getting more back to the point in Mass Effect you choose the dialogue of your character Great, this will just take a minute With so many human colonies being attacked I'm not sure that one Spectre is enough What if you signed me on as another Spectre? Conrad, I don't think that's a good idea not all the decisions in Mass Effects are based on the dialogue. 
You get to pick other things, like what planet are you going to go to next? There's no levels here. No level 1, level 2, level 3 in a linear fashion like normal. The choice is yours. If you want to go and do this particular mission first, then that is your decision. Or if you really want to, you can go back to the cantina and have a drink and a dance. Whatever, the choice is yours. In ME1, that's short for Mass Effect 1, you have to make a really big decision. Now this decision, along with many other decisions, will affect the outcome of the next two games in the series, before they were even released. Alliance ships, move in. Save the Destiny Ascension. Now this is immersion on another level. Bioware, the studio that brought you Mass Effect series, also developed Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Learn how to use a force and decide the fate of the galaxy. Be as evil as Darth Vader, or as heroic as Obi-Wan Kenobi. The choice is yours. Okay, so I've talked a lot about immersion. And as you can probably tell, to me personally, it is a hugely important factor. But this factor also involves customization, which I haven't mentioned yet. This adds to that immersive factor. Choose what your character looks like, how he talks, how he walks. Design your own paintwork on your Mitsubishi Lancer Revolution. Choose the decals you want and the big 21 rims. Being able to customise whether it be your character, your weapons, cars or anything else adds to the immersive factor and allows the player greater control of something within the game, making it more personal to them. Being able to personalise things in game allows for a more unique experience, and personal experiences are usually long lasting. I think it is safe to say that immersion and customisation have a huge role to play in making a game a good game. Okay, so we have found a game that is fun to play and brings us joy. Graphically, we are happy with how it looks in relation to what we expect, the mechanics feel good and realistic, and the controls are smooth and fit the game. Finally, the game allows us to make choices, however minor this could be. I want to be a boy, or I want to be a girl, I want to have a beard. My friends, we have found a good game, potentially. I mean, nothing is absolute and only Sith deal with those. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. But we are still missing one thing, something really important that will decide whether the game is good or far beyond that and amazing. Have you guessed it yet? Of course you have. Factor number five, and the most important factor, the one that turns a good game amazing, again for me personally, but it has to be the story. The story has got to be the number one reason for deciding whether a game is amazing or not. Granted, there are games that don't actually have stories and have never intended to, as they are online multiplayer PvP games or puzzle games, etc. And they can still be fun, but they aren't going to leave a long-lasting feeling of enjoyment, satisfaction and a whole range of emotions on the player as much as a story does. This is the reason we sit down and read books or write books. It is the reason we become filmmakers, or go to the cinemas. We turn on our TVs to watch soaps like EastEnders. GET OUT OF MY PUB! Because we enjoy the adverse storylines. Stories teach us how to act in certain situations. They teach us how to love, be loved, inspire, or be inspired. They teach us All wrong right, from right, see. and right from I'm wrong. I'm a bad guy. Stop me from killing you. What? No, please. Please don't hurt me. Why are you doing and help this? develop our social and behavioural qualities. This is how a gun in your face feels. It happens to me every day. You can't handle this. Committing violent acts like this in games doesn't make us violent people. It doesn't define who we are. And even as children we can differentiate between playing an alter ego in a video game and the real world. In fact, I would argue that by playing a villain in a video game, helps us to understand ourselves and hopefully reduce or suppress any violent tendencies that someone may have. Stories help you experience emotions such as fear, guilt and regret, but also love, passion and pride. We love stories and have developed a wide range of ways to be involved in them, whether it is our passion to read or our love for the theatre, through song, film, text or illustrations. We enjoy stories at every age in our lives and we remember our favourites. We learn from them and develop ourselves around them, and they are an important part of our life. The more involved in a story, the greater its power and lasting effects. I can honestly say that I am an advocate for video game based stories. Unlike a book or a film or a song, 
When you play video games, you take control of the actions of your character. You customise them to look like you, or to look how you wish you looked, or you customise them to look ridiculous. You navigate the battlefield the way you want to. You choose the right weapons for the right job, or the vehicle that suits the track. You control the steering and the braking, the sneaking and the jumping, <laughs> the sails and the rudder. You sit through cutscenes, anxious with what's happening. Then you take control and go toe to toe with the final boss. This is a reason why I love role-playing games like Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Fable and Mass Effect. I was literally crying at the conclusion of Red Dead Redemption 2. Years later, it isn't the graphics that stay with me, or how fun the game was. It isn't the quality of the mechanics or the controls. The immersion and the customization helped me to get involved in the story, but weren't lasting memories. They belong to the story. The development of the characters and the journey they go on from beginning to end. This is the ultimate factor that makes a game amazing. And there you have it guys, they are my factors that make a game good and the ultimate factor that makes a game amazing. It's took quite some time to put this together and I really hope that you've all enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it so hopefully you have. Of course the comment section below is yours to leave any feedback as necessary. I appreciate that these are my opinions of what, what makes a game good or amazing and we won't all share that same opinion. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. Did you share some of the opinions of mine? Are those factors what you'd consider factors that make a game good or amazing? Or are they completely opposite? My name is Retro Reclaimer and it has been an absolute pleasure.